Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. The Bible contains remarkable stories of miracles and divine interventions. Moses parted the sea. Peter healed a man lame from his mother's womb. Jesus drove demons out of people and raised others from the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? We too have a beam of divine light and guidance that God has put within the heart of every man. And it's one of the greatest proofs that there is a God. More amazing supernatural things are happening than we realize. This is Divine Intervention, the interview show that features intriguing people who've experienced the hand of God in amazing ways. Divine Intervention was created and produced with the purpose of encouraging believers, spiritual seekers, and skeptics alike that Jesus is alive and is still performing miracles and working in the world today. I believe in miracles. Here's your host, Daniel Fazina. Hello, friend, and welcome to Divine Intervention Radio. I am your host, Daniel Fazina. So excited, privileged, and humbled to bring you yet another amazing testimony of how the Lord has worked in someone's life. I really think that uh, today's guests are going to inspire you and encourage you. Um, We have a theme today. We're going to be talking about uh, sports, football in particular. So if you're a sports fan especially, I think you're going to enjoy this story. Before we get to our special guests, I want to remind you that uh, if you miss any of the shows, they're all archived on divineinterventionradio.com, divineinterventionradio.com, also on facebook.com forward slash divineinterventionradio, and YouTube, youtube.com forward slash divineinterventionradio. If you go to the YouTube channel, please subscribe to the channel. That's going to let you know when we have a new episode uploaded. You'll get a notification there. And if you'd like to connect with me directly, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at DanielFazina1 on Twitter.com. That's at DanielFazina, the numeral one, on Twitter.com. All right, friend, I've got an amazing story for you. Two gentlemen who I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from. If you've ever had a dream or a goal and you thought maybe it was too late in your life to achieve it, I think today's guests will kind of show you that it may not be too late. Today's guests are Coach Ronnie Gage and Emmett C. Tom Thompson, and they've got a quite an amazing intersecting journey. Let me read you a little bit about them from the back of their book. It's called The Life Coach, Small Town Lessons on Faith, Family, and Football. In small town Decatur, Texas, football was life, and Ronnie Gage couldn't wait to become a Decatur Eagle. His football ability was decent, but he knew there wasn't a big demand for a 150-pound center and safety, so he focused his career goals on the next best thing, coaching. This provided a way to give back to a sport and to a community who had given him so much. Nearly 40 years later, after countless winning seasons and championships, Coach Gage found himself in a unique position coaching an unusual player. When Emmett Tom Thompson joined the Austin College football team as a spry 59-year-old kicker, Coach Gage had his doubts, but Thompson's dedication and tenacity spoke for himself on the field, and the two men forged an unshakable friendship built on three loves, faith, family, and football. In The Life Coach, Coach Gage shares the important life lessons he's learned both on and off the field. Tom Thompson, kicking coach, author, and speaker, lends supporting anecdotes based on his many years in leadership roles. Together, they hope to inspire players and parents, coaches and crowds to live a life of faith on and off the field, to make the most of every opportunity, and to have fun while doing it. I had an opportunity to sit down with both gentlemen at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. Excuse the poor audio quality. It was recorded on site and there was some background noise. But let's go to that interview right now. Coach Ronnie and Tom, welcome to Divine Intervention. So great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. Sure. It's a a pleasure and an honor. And you guys have quite a unique story on how God has brought you together and Mm -hmm. kind of intersected your lives. And we certainly want to get to that. Uh, But before we do, let's go to the beginning a little bit. I want to get a a bit of a background on each of you. Coach uh, Gage, can we start with you? Can you tell us about your background and what that was like growing up for you? Yeah, I grew up in a small town. I'm sorry. Yeah, I grew up in a small town in Decatur. Uh, uh, Grew up in a semi-dysfunctional family. My mom and dad had a lot of problems and uh, uh, lost my dad when I was 13. Sorry to hear that. And 
Well, it, my coaches, that's one of the reasons I got into coaching, mm -hmm. because they were such great mentors from that point on in my life. And, and uh, uh, big reasons why I coached for 42 years. Okay. Uh, became a Christian when I was 12 years old, when, and uh, uh, you know, I felt God tugging and tugging and tugging, and for people that, that feel that, it's real. You know, I won't tell them today, that's, that's real, but it took me going to church camp. I got invited to church camp under the pretense they needed another baseball player for their team, and, okay. you know, <laughs> came back, you know, with the acceptance of God and, and you know, uh, walked the path that next Sunday morning in church, and except God is my, uh, you know, Savior, and that was at 12 years old. So uh, it, it took me a while, and, and uh, uh, my mom, she was, a, she was a hero in all this this story. She, she raised four of us, and uh, she grew up in, in Oklahoma in a poor family, and she was baptized in the river. And, uh, nice. But uh, uh, was, was very strong influence uh, on all of us, and... and, and you know, it was always there for us. So, you know, it wasn't always an easy road. And, sure. and then, you know, uh, there's no doubt that, that there's got to be God intervention because of the way the story played out and, and the, the direction I went and, and the things I've done and, and uh, uh, the success I've had. It, it, you know, I'll, I'll, I give God all the credit. There's no doubt. I couldn't have done it without, you know. His grace, and, That's amazing. and uh, uh, you're one of the most winningest coaches in uh, in Texas high school football history. Is that correct? Well, I, I've won a few. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he's a humble I, guy, but yes, he's I, very humble. His I record am. is uh, ama amazing, uh, and, and that can be misleading too, because unfortunately, this day and time, the coach gets too much of the credit or gets too much of the blame, I guess, but. It takes a team, and sure. I've been blessed with so many good people around me. My, my, I had wonderful coaches, uh, tremendous parents, school systems, uh, support from school systems, teachers, parents, uh, and a family that that love this business. My, my son and my daughter are both in the coaching profession, and uh, wonderful. Uh, my wife has got a chapter in the book about being a coach's wife, and. Uh, so it, it takes a team, and it takes the chemistry of that team to be successful. And uh, I tell people, you you, you can't uh, let your failures or your successes identify your or you know, you know who you are. You can't let them uh, be the sole sole fact. You got to stay focused and continue to look forward. And and that's what I've tried to do over 42 years of coaching. It's wonderful. Well, I think I, I appreciate you know what you said because one of the marks of a great leader is understanding that he has to surround himself with great people and you know team build mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's something that uh, is obviously evident in your life and your you know, absolute your record. Uh, so it's great that you recognize that. Uh, the book he's referring to is called The Life Coach: Small Town Lessons on Faith, Family, and Football, and it's by our special guest here, Coach Ron Engage and Emmett C. Tom Thompson. The second, and he's a doctor as well too. Uh, Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your and your faith? Sure. Well, uh, similar uh, story to Coach. Uh, I lost my dad at an early age. He, I was 19. Oh wow! And I'm very sorry um, to hear that. And dysfunctional family, and this. I mean, I was uh, a juvenile delinquent, ba basically without a record. Hmm. And. Uh, I was raised Catholic. By the time I was 16, I'd become an atheist because I just really, yeah, wow. I just it was religion, mm -hmm. and um, I used to find myself. Uh, well, my mother made us go to church, so uh, what I would do to circumvent having to go, I would ride my bike down to the church, get the program, and then bicycle over to the field and play touch football with my friends, okay. and then go home and show her. The program. Oh, so she so, didn't go with you. No, oh, no, she didn't. Okay, and she didn't. But n nonetheless, uh, I, I didn't really have a relationship with God. Sure. And uh, I guess it was I was I was 24 when I got saved, and uh, I became a Christian by listening to a sermon where I kind of understood why God sent Jesus. And it was wasn't. That at your Catholic church, your local Catholic well, church. Well, yeah, or? but Catholic church for me was you, you went to mass and you you know you, you 
didn't really have a, a relationship. And frankly, because of that, I didn't. I felt like if I was supposed to have a relationship with God, why was I going through a man to do that? Mm -hmm. Right. You know. So, so it just it, it, the religion part just didn't. Uh, I guess draw me to it. So anyway, um, I had inherited uh, more money than I should have when I was young, and I predictably did the things that a young person would do without limits, and just, you know, had a heck of a life for a number of years. And I say heck of a life because I can't use the other word uh, on your show. <laughs> And, uh, Wait a second, are you talking about hell? Yes. That's we talk I, about hell. Okay, well, I know, but I mean, not in we that way. We want to try to steer people away from it. Though. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, uh, I just, I, I remember when um, uh, I, I really felt like that God was telling me I'm real. And that I don't mean to make this too long and, and more too funny, but I had just come back from spending the weekend in Las Vegas and having spent the weekend with Elvis Presley and his wife. Wow. And, and so here I'm, I'm a 21-year-old guy that was doing things that a lot of other people aren't doing. And uh, and I was standing by my pool, and uh, I started talking to who I thought might have been God, and I'd remembered that uh, God had spoken through a bush, so I started talking to my ground cover by the pool. And I said... <laughs> God, if you're real, you need to show me. And if if you are, I promise I won't tell anybody. But I'm into meeting people now. See, so having had that experience for that weekend. But why were you even in the frame of mind to start thinking about God or questioning God? I, at that I don't. Point? I, I don't know. I just can't. I can't explain that. Okay. And it was just like. He was drawing you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, six months after that beside the pool conversation with the ground cover, my life just completely fell apart. I was married at the time, my wife let me, left me. I lost most of that money, which would be very difficult to do. I mean, I went through cars and stuff, and anyway, uh, I, remember I was out uh, with some friends, and we were going to dinner, and I overheard a, a couple in front of us talking about going to this non-denominational church in, in Dallas. And I thought to myself, yeah, I just want to be taught the Bible. I don't want to have to go through all the religious stuff. Right. And so I chose to go there on an Easter Sunday when I was 24, and that's when I heard that message, realized why God sent Jesus. And I was listening to a, a, a pastor speak kind of like he was a a corporal and we were all privates out in the congregation and he'd been in the foxhole. Like Instead, he was literally a soldier? No, no, no. I'm oh, just okay. saying though that you know we're all soldiers and yeah. he, he was not a general talking to his troops. He was a you know, I've been out there shot at in the foxhole and this is real. Yeah. And so that led me and so I, I sat in my in the pew and said, you know what, I understand why you you were you sent Jesus and I, I want you to come live in my heart and it was just like that no no big explosions no nothing well I went from that to just trying to be good and uh, salvation is great but unless you you know as, as you know we're in a spiritual war and it's like playing football with just a helmet on with salvation you get this helmet of salvation try to play a football game with just a helmet on I, yeah. yeah, I don't know how rugby players do it, honestly. Like, yeah, nothing well, at all. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I was beaten up as bad as I was before I was saved. Okay. And then realized there's got to be something more to, to, there needs to be reality to my faith. And uh, I got, you know, I got spirit filled later in life. I was in my 40s. And, and that's when I made Jesus Lord of my life. It's one thing to make him Savior. Right. No thing that when you make him Lord, and that's when my life did a 180. Well, that's so. great to hear. I mean, we we talk about having a, like a born again experience, and I, I tell people often that just like being born only takes a few minutes, being born again only takes a few minutes of praying a prayer, but growing, you know, takes a lifetime. Yeah. And the same thing with growing in your grace or in the grace of salvation and developing mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a as a follower of Christ. It's it's a lifetime journey. So I'm glad to hear that. Uh, 
that happened with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you guys are, are both obviously Christians and walking with the Lord. That's great to hear. So you guys have this book. It's called The Life Coach. And you had an interesting intersection of your life. Uh, coach Ronnie, you were a high school coach, football coach for many years, and also college as well. And now I understand that, Tom, you became uh, a football kicker yes. in your 60s. Is that right? Correct. I learned to kick uh, when I was 59. 59 years old. And then I actually kicked in the game when I was 61. Okay. I, I wasn't even aware. I thought there were, like, age limits for college players. There is. Okay. <laughs> except except uh, Division One and Two, they have restrictions. And you can get some waivers for military service, et cetera. Okay. But... The only division you can actually, there is no age limit, is Division Three, And this Austin College was a Division Three school. Okay. Now tell me how this came about, because obviously this is a, a lifetime story. I mean, how I did wasn't, you become a kicker? I wasn't uh, planning to do this. Okay. I wasn't planning to disrupt Coach Gage's life when I showed up to his office either. But uh, Now at the time, Coach Gage, you were coaching this particular team? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I was uh, in my office at one of my fitness centers, and I saw the story of Mike Flint, who, uh, at the age of 59, was going back to college to finish his senior year. He also had to navigate eligibility, et cetera. And it caused me to think, since I'm in the health and fitness industry and an author, that if you maintain fitness throughout your life when you get older, you might be able to do that sort of thing. So in in talking with the co-author on previous books, we worked off that premise, and in our concept talks, I said, you know what, I might have eligibility left. What do you think about me going back to school to be a kicker? I feel like that could help our our book. So you went to, back to college specifically to become a kicker? Right, okay. and, and to write a book. See, I had already had my doctorate, so I mean, yeah. that was another thing to navigate eligibility with, is I have a terminal degree, and chances of having eligibility, that's a miracle. Uh, so anyway, my co-author at the time, he said, sure, because it wasn't him. And I started sending off emails to the NCAA, find what I needed to do. They sent me back, you've got to go to the, the school, and they'll determine eligibility. I sent an email to the athletic director, who sent me a very polite email saying, thank you for your email, but chances are you probably don't have any eligibility left. I placed a phone call. We had a conversation. He said, well, you know what, you just might. And so he, the next step was he needed to, to kind of give a heads up to Coach that this this could start. So, uh, co- <laughs> Coach, I want to hear your reaction. When you get this call saying you have a 60-something-year-old man who wants to come and join your college team, what was your reaction to that? What would your first thought be, Daniel? <laughs> This guy's probably a little off his rocker. I That's think. exactly <laughs> what my Thank you. Okay. Uh, did you even take it seriously? Uh, you, you know, I, 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 out of respect, I did. I mean, okay. I, I listened, and, and uh, I could have started laughing and said, hey, you need to get on out of here. But, no, I, I listened, and, and uh, uh, you know, after a while, I knew he was serious about it. And my, my first thought was I wanted to make sure he didn't have an agenda. You know, he wasn't coming in because I'm very passionate about it my profession, sure. uh, uh, the coaching industry, the teams I've coached, the, the, the schools I'm at. And I wanted to make sure there wasn't an agenda, a hidden agenda here that was going to come back and bite us on down the road. And uh, and after I felt comfortable with that and, and we had talked it out, then we took the next step and involved the athletic director and then found out actually he did have, you know, that year and, and uh, he'd already worked, worked that, but he had to work out that part with the school is what I'm trying to say. And, and so we did, and, and uh, with no idea that, you know, all this other stuff would happen, you know, the, the kick, the oldest player to suit up, the book, the, the friendship, you know, I was just going to let him come fulfill his, his last year, and, and uh, uh, because, and, and I didn't want a lot of distractions over it, I just, but then you got to go through the next step, and, you know, Okay, guys, here's your new teammate, and you know you walk in a bunch of 19, 20, 21 year old guys, and they're looking at each other. Okay, what's the joke, you know? And, <laughs> uh, but but they quickly became, uh, you, you know, a relationship developed and uh, within the locker room, and, and it really wasn't a distraction. It worked out fine, and 
uh, you know, I told Tom, you're going to do just like everybody else. You know, expect the same. If you're going to be a football player and part of this team, you're going to have to come out and work and condition and do the things you've got to do. And uh, and he did. And and uh, we got down toward the end of the season, and I'd not let him kick. Uh, so I thought, well, here's here's the chance. So I gave him the opportunity to go in. He made it, and you know the rest is history. It became went into the world record book, with, right? Without a doubt. And, uh, so you were the uh, oldest. Uh, I'm the oldest NCAA uh, player and the oldest NCAA player to score a point That's in amazing. a game. Okay. But well, coach is kind of leaving out some of the stuff because he's right. kind. Let's get the details. Here. I was just going to say though that. <laughs> You know, he he wasn't sure, nor was I, uh, nor was probably a lot of the teammates that I had, if I was going to be able to be successful. And he's the kind of a coach, he, he doesn't put you into a game because he feels, has, you know, feels sorry for you or right. it's a mercy, and he's going to do a mercy thing. He'll put you in if he has confidence that you can do it and you can help the team. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to point that out because. Uh, uh, people need to understand that we were playing our biggest rival. I mean, it's like Texas, Oklahoma, in our, uh, but in our version. Right. And he, he put me in, in this early in the second quarter to tie the game. Wow. And very significant. Very, it was. And I think that adds to the story of, you know, uh, because two weeks prior to that, wasn't it two weeks or three, he came to me and said, you know, you're doing better. And if you keep doing better, I may put you in a game. That's right, because just because you're on the team, there's no guarantee yeah, yeah, you actually yeah. play, There's right? never any guarantees, and I make no promises. Sure. You know, you're, you're in your stripes. And it's what I expect out of any player. You know. uh, now, how, how far was the kick? Oh, it's just an extra it's point. It's 20 yard field goal. 20? Yeah, it's 20. It's, but it's an extra point. But, nice. Uh, I probably it, couldn't do it. It was his limit. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you say when you first met him or when you first heard about him you said he didn't have an agenda or, or a hidden agenda you did have an agenda right but it wasn't a hidden agenda no i told him i was here because of what i said is right. i, I want to write a book and i want to be able to sit because see, i've been fit my whole life uh -huh. and uh there's only been two years since i was 15 that i wasn't able to exercise okay so and i and so physically I, i'm in a very high fitness category but you, i don't look like i'm you know some you know, a superstar that can do all these great things. I look like an average guy, and because I am, a, I am an average guy, but I, I prioritize fitness. Right. Well, that's a. I'm 71 now, and I'm able to get a rent. 71. I would not have guessed that. Mm -hmm. You look amazing. Well, thank you. I've been blessed. You're welcome. And, uh, but what I'm saying is, is that uh, it's not about what you can do. It's about your quality of life. Mm. And if you're in good health, everybody around you enjoys that. Right. You know, and so I wanted to encourage people, especially the body of Christ, to prioritize fitness because they don't. Right. And the, basically the worst cohort of physical fitness are pastors. You know, too many potlucks with the church. Well, there's the, and, stuff and the, then up. think about you know this <laughs> like in Ephesians six. I mean, we're in spiritual warfare and the stress of battle. Do you know why the military has uh, physical fitness in their training? Because they need it when they go to war. Right? Well, but what's the point? What's the point of it? It's not to jump in fox, foxholes faster or get over a wall. It's to handle the stress of battle. And you'll notice that the protocol gets more arduous depending on the mission. So a basic recruit has a certain physical protocol and a navy seal or a ranger you know they have very, very difficult protocol but it's tied to what the mission is well pastors need to understand that you know they're they're under an assault hmm. and if they don't handle that stress of battle they have heart trouble they have you know other issues and it affects their parishioners I think I think Americans in general um, struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Just obesity and just, it's just tough to. Well, hear. they're more concerned with how they look than their quality of life. Things. Here's the here's the lie and the truth. Okay. The lie is if you work out, you look like you did when you were 20. The truth is, if you exercise regular, 
you can look, act, feel, and function 10 years younger than your chronological age. You said I didn't look 71, but I probably look 61. And so that's what I'm getting at, is if you just do that in a consistent fashion, it's no different than prayer. If, if you're praying regular, you're going through the issues of life kind of like this, but if you only pray when it's, you know, it's <clears throat> like yeah. that. It's up and down. It's very dramatic. Good advice from uh, Dr. Tom Thompson, and uh, we're here with him and his partner, Ronnie Gage, here. We're talking about their amazing life, and, and their book is called The Life Coach, Small Town Lessons on Faith, Family, and Football. I want to dive into more of that uh, when we come back. But please stay with us. We'll be right back after the break with more on Divine Intervention Radio. You're listening to Divine Intervention with Daniel Fazina, and we'll return in just a moment. I believe in miracles. Hey, this is Daniel Fazina of Divine Intervention Radio. The Bible contains some incredible stories of miracles and divine interventions. Jesus calmed a raging storm, healed paralytics, and even raised the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? The answer to this question, as you will see from reading my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today, is an emphatic yes. Contained within the book is a collection of amazing true stories that attest to this fact. You will read the astonishing first-hand accounts of people who have been healed of paralysis, terminal cancer and tumors through prayer. You will see the love of God powerfully transform the life of an Islamic terrorist. You will witness the liberation of the demon-possessed, the resurrection of the dead, and much more. Prepare to be awed and inspired as you experience Divine Intervention. More information about Divine Intervention, 50 true stories of God's miracles today can be found at www.divineinterventionradio.com or by calling 800-247-4784. That's 1-800-247-4784. Hey, this is Eric Metaxas. You are listening to Divine Intervention Radio with Daniel Fazina. Shout to the Lord, but you're too tame, darling. You give up on bad days. Welcome back to Divine Intervention Radio. I'm your host, Daniel Fazina. And if you're just tuning in, we've been speaking with our special guest, Dr. Tom Thompson and Coach Ronnie Gage. And they were sharing a little bit about their life and how it intersected. And they have a great book out. It's called The Life Coach, Small Town Lessons on Faith, Family, and Football. Gentlemen, welcome back. Good to be here. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Sure. Coach Gage, um, you talk about, in your book, uh, you include many remarkable accomplishments but you also detail some extremely difficult circumstances that you went through. Can you um, elaborate on some of those and how you got through them? Well, you know, first of all, coaching in general is, is you know, a series of peaks and valleys. And, right. and, and uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of highs and there's a lot of lows, and, and uh, uh, you've got to learn to stay focused and, and work through all those. But uh, the biggest obstacle for me didn't have anything to do with my profession or the coaching end. It, it had to do with family, and we lost a daughter who would have been 38 today. Uh, oh my gosh! With brain cancer I'm 10 so years ago while I was coaching at Austin College, and uh, she was a beautiful young lady, and 
How old was she? She, she, she was 28. She was 28, okay. just in the prime of her life, really, really getting going, just got married. And, uh, uh, just a tremendous young lady. She she had a smile that light up a room, and you, you know. But uh, and as a dad, you're supposed to be able to take care of your your family, you know. And, yeah. and there was just I felt helpless. Uh, I'd spend every morning. I'd get to school. I'd go to the chapel and, and you know uh, get on my knees and pray and. and do everything I could. I spent a lot of time on the internet hoping there was a miracle in there that there wasn't and just prayed and prayed and prayed about it and she passed away. And, uh, and so for a long time, I'm not going to lie, I was really angry. I couldn't understand why God could let something like this happen. And uh, uh, my wife was, we were both just distraught and, and actually my, my, my wife kind of got me back on track and reminded me we still had two young children who were hurting two or two two more children that were hurting too and sure. they needed us and we had to move forward uh, and then I got you know to thinking about my faith and, and my belief and that, you know God went through some trials and tribulations too he, he sacrificed uh, himself and that's the reason I can feel good about Jess today is knowing that's where she's at you know and that she's smiling down on us and uh so that helped, and, and uh, you know, it's something that, that it's hard to explain unless you've been through it, but you, you learn to deal with it, you learn to live with it, but there's times, moments, situations that sometimes you just feel like somebody jumps up and grabs you by the throat and suffocates you, you know? And, yeah. Uh, and a gentleman told me one time, he said, you know, you're going to go through a lot of downtime for a while but he said there's going to come a point in time where the good memories take over and I think that's that's God's work and I, I think we've reached that point to, to where now we can talk about Jess, we can tell stories about Jess, we can smile and laugh about Jess and, uh, and, and, and when her name comes up and we talk about it, I can smile because I can see her big smile, you know, smiling down on me. So uh, by the grace of God we've been able to get through that and, and, and move on and, and uh, uh, we feel very strongly, uh, and, and it helps strengthen our faith too. You know, sure. as mad as I was, uh, it's, he's turned it around into a point where it's made me a, a stronger disciple, and, and, and I'm still not where I need to be. I need I need to be a better Christian. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but there's also no doubt in my life that, that he is my guidance and. Uh, so anyway, that was the toughest one. We worked through that, sure. and, and we still have two beautiful children who both coach, by the way. That's wonderful. I'm I'm happy to hear that, and I'm I'm really um, first of all I'm, I'm saddened that your daughter passed away, and that was but at the same time I, I really appreciate what you said about you know being able to at some point finally the smile comes back if you think about her and you're in that point of grieving, and also the thing that separates. Christianity, I think, from any other faith, is the fact that God does not leave us alone in our suffering. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, what religion you have, if you're on this earth, you're going to suffer. I mean, we just live in that kind of broken, sinful world. But the difference is that God, the God of the Bible, is so personal that He would come to earth wrapped in flesh, sacrifice His only Son so that we could live and have life. And, you know, when Jesus walked this earth, He suffered. A lot. Absolutely. And when Jesus went, when Lazarus died, he wept. He identified with our pain and our suffering. So it's not like he left us alone. And I'm yeah. glad that you you realize that and you can draw strength from that. Um, I don't know where I would be without Christ. I mean, I had cancer when I was 27, mm. and my my wife's been through cancer, and Jeez. my wife's mother was murdered not too long ago. Oh my. So going through all that. Um, Without Jesus, I don't know how we'd get through it, honestly. Uh, I truly believe people without God, without faith, they, they live a, a really lonely life. They've yeah. got to. Uh, and, you know, pray for those people. But, Absolutely. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons we do this show. We want to encourage people that despite all mm -hmm. the pain, the mm -hmm. suffering, the loss, God is still real. He's present with us, and He can He can help us through that. Sure. You know, and if not for the resurrection of Christ, this would all be for naught, for nothing. But that would be cruel. It would be. <laughs> but praise God, He didn't leave us alone. Sure. Um, Coach, you also talk about 
how um, you'd rather see heart than talent. Yes, sir. Tell, tell me about that. What does that mean for you as a coach? Well, I, and, I think uh, over the years I've seen teams with, with just with tons of talent that went nowhere, that, that didn't develop, that didn't get it done. And, and uh, I've coached many teams. I had a team in 1996, one of our championship teams, who had just uh, – there, there wasn't a Division One college player on that team. But, uh, but those kids just – the chemistry was – Tremendous, just tremendously strong, and and they all had heart, and they 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 believed in each other. They they bought into what we we gave them, and and uh, uh, just day in day out went out and, and, and worked and worked and worked and worked and got better and better and better, and and uh, it, it was a, a a team of love. I, I mean, we generally cared about each other, and. Uh, it was just so much fun. I look back on those years, and I had a great team in '93, a very talented football team that won a championship. Uh, but the difference was these kids weren't near as talented, but the chemistry was so strong, hmm. and uh, uh, it was just a joy to be around that every day. There wasn't a day we went out there that, that I could say was a was, was a tough day, or well, it was just fun. It was fun to coach those kind of kids. And I've seen too many that, in, in this day and time, with, with college restrictions now, when they went to the, the scholarship limits, it's cut out a lot of those type of guys. Those guys can't miss anymore, so they are looking for the 6'4", the, 6'5", the guys, or the 4'3", four, 4'4", four, four guys, or the guys that weigh 275 pounds or 300-pound linemen. And, uh, and, and a lot of these kids that may be an inch too short or half a step too slow, you know, are getting left behind, and that's what the beauty of Division Three, Division mm -hmm. Two football is. A lot of those kids are able to continue, uh, but uh, there's a lot of good football players out there that get overlooked because they're an inch too short or they're a step too slow. But man, you can't passion, passion for the game, hard work ethic, you can't substitute for it. That's right. Even I think in anything, in, in life in general, Absolutely. you want to be successful. I mean, part of it is just consistently showing up right. and <laughs> having a passion for it. Yep. And you can make up uh, a lot with hard work what, mm. what you don't have in talent. Absolutely. So, good stuff. Now, Dr. Tom, you were talking a little earlier off the air about uh, driving one day and how the Lord was kind of speaking to you when you were deciding to go to... Uh, to college, I well, think it was. It, it wasn't. Uh, I'd already decided. Okay. And, and because um, of, of the fact that I didn't get a uh, waiver uh, initially from the NCAA to let me automatically start playing, I showed up for the 2008 season. Okay. Well, when I got notified that there was eligibility, there was a caveat that I had to uh, go an entire year as a student to be able to fulfill their transfer clause. Okay. So here I was again, with a terminal degree having to go back to school and sit in classroom. And although I looked at it as a plus because it was going to help me develop relationships outside of the football team. Mm -hmm. And also for them to see that I, even though I had a doctorate, I was working as hard in class as they were. I'm curious, what was your major? Well, um, I just had a uh, general studies uh, at first because I had to go through an undergrad program. Right. So the uh, I was just taking courses that they, you know, I had general psych and uh, was taking some uh, history courses, things like that. And um, anyway, uh, it, it, the, the year went fast, but for Coach Gage, he had to figure out how to how to still include me with the team. So he, in a very generous way, just turned me into what he called a student coach. But I really wasn't a student coach. I was a student that that really helped the team with the uh, the segment timing of blowing an air horn every five minutes to let them know <laughs> that. And then I got to be on the sidelines during games and stuff, but. There again, it eased me into the, you know, the, the culture there, and it, it also gave him a chance to maybe even get to know me at a distance that would help at a, at a later time. Okay. But my point of bringing that up was 
I didn't know at that point, even still, if I had was going to be given any eligibility from the NCAA. So here I am. I'm in school, and I have a, a two-year-old son at home and a wife that works full time, and I'm driving 65 miles back and forth to come up to school. And I, I started going, you know, God, if I'm not supposed to do this. You know, you got to let me know because I need to go home and be with my family and this, that, and the other. And I see you don't you don't have to help Nolan Ryan throw a fastball. I mean, he's just throwing his fastball, and that's what you want him to do. Well, I need this. I need the same. I'm asking for the same thing, okay. except just in my situation. And by golly, if it wasn't that afternoon that I was told by the athletic director that I was granted eligibility. That very day, while you were asking, why it asked? So God answers prayers. He does. <laughs> and then, and then the other thing where it talks about. See, I'm, I'm, have, I'm learning what's you've got to develop what's called patient faith. Okay. You've got, to, you've got to be patient with your faith. You can't just have faith and then expect it to materialize. Coach Gage can tell you, for something I, I felt God wanted me to do, He sure made it hard. I mean, because I, I, I hurt my leg. Uh, I overkicked in the summer and had developed an injury that if I had let it go too long, I would have had to have surgery and I wouldn't be sitting here with Coach talking to you. Well, I can't imagine. I mean, being a, a high school or college football kicker would be easy at any age. And here you are taking it on in your 60s. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I give you a lot of credit for that. That's well, amazing. Well, I... And, and, I think it was good, too, for those young men to see me not quit. Right. You know, I mean, I kept showing up, and I was good, bad, and ugly. I was either losing a bet to him for cokes for missing kicks, or uh, I was having to deal with, with I think there was a time there, Coach even came out one day, and I'd, I'd been going through a lot of therapy in the training room and hadn't been able to make practice. And he saw me out there, and I might have barely gotten a couple of no-step kicks. He walked back and said, you know what? Something to the effect that this is a miracle that you're out here even doing this. Mm. And that was encouraging. Sure. Coach, I was going to ask you what the uh, effect or inspiration on your teammates or the guys around him, what effect it had on them to see him out there at his age doing what he was doing. Well, I think they they learned to accept him real quick. Uh, And and he became one of the guys, you know, and... uh, and the fact that he'd been on the sideline the year before, and, and they'd gotten to know him a little bit, and, and uh, he'd gotten to know them, and and knew the story, and knew what he was trying to do, helped mm-hmm. with the whole transition part of it. So, uh, and, and you know, once he became a, a teammate, a player, it, it just there wasn't a lot of distraction. It was just you know another guy out there every day, and they accepted that. Now, when he made the kick, they were all tremendously excited about it because they know. You know what it had taken for him to get in there and, and to, to to go through the process of, of getting to keep that one kick. So, and why so did you decide to thing. put him in when you did? You know, I don't know. I, I just felt like it was his time. It was yeah. his time to to to, to, to go. And uh, uh, he had worked hard. And I'm I'm very sympathetic to the fact people that that play. I grew up as a young man, and you know, for a couple of years, I was one of those guys. It was hard to get on the field, you know, until mm-hmm. I got older. And and I've always been very sympathetic to the fact, you know, I've got kids that work their tails off every day and don't get the opportunity. And, and uh, you know, he'd been uh, determined, he'd been persistent, he'd, he'd been consistent, and uh, why not? Let's go. And All right. so I said, Tom, it's your time, go. And I had it to took me a couple, a couple of times to, he was kind of in a trance, he kind of looked at me like, <laughs> get, get out there. there. So, I don't know if I've told Coach this story or not, but it's true. Uh, and it was it coincided with him coming to me and telling me that if I got better, he might put me into the game. But I remember just about three or four days before that last game, I, just, I prayed uh, in, in the scripture of touch the king's heart. And that's what I think happened. And I will also say this, and, and because it's Jess's birthday, uh, she had a lot to do with that kick going through. I know it. And 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 uh, now, was it, this about ten years ago when this happened? It, right, two thousand nine. Okay. So 
so was she alive at that time? Or? She, she was she, alive okay. uh, for part of she the time. She passed I was away in, 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 in June of '09, and I kicked in November. Okay. So, so it was around the same time this was all going on. Right. Okay. Right. And, That's uh, amazing. And, and of course, this book is dedicated to her. It's and, wonderful. And, whatnot, but, uh, and you know, I want to talk about the book, how how you actually got together and decided mm-hmm. to collaborate on this book and then after that if you tell me that story I want to know what the effect of, of the book has been and you know what kind of feedback you're getting on it so sure. you want to talk about how the book came about well we talked about it a long time he Tom is definitely the reason the book's here I, he, he was very inspirational in, in pushing me forward to, to do the book and he knew uh, it was something that I wanted to do I, I felt strongly about doing something in you know in Jesse's name that would be around for a long, long time, and we got talking about a book, and, and and then our stories are very similar as far as growing up and the trials and tribulations that, that we've been through over the years, and uh, some of the same obstacles, and and uh, and then the fact that God brought us together in, in this venture, uh, and uh, so He gave me an opportunity to tell a story, and 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 uh, I think there's a good story in there. There's a lot of lessons in there, and then. Uh, he comes along and, and reinforces a lot of the things that, that are in each chapter. What do you want to um, convey to the readers? Like when they read the life coach, what do you want them to take away from it? Well, that, that nothing's easy. You know, you you work for everything you get. It's nothing. Nothing's a given, and, and uh, uh, God's grace is a good guide for all of us uh, to, to follow. And we talked about team. It's important to to understand the, the the importance of a team and what it takes to to be successful. And one of the things I, I tell my kids every day, I pray, something I, I believe in is kind of a motto, so to speak. But it's okay to be the good guy, and that entails so many things. It means it's okay to hug and kiss your mom or dad in public. It's okay to be the good guy in class. It's okay to have faith in God. Mm. It's okay to treat your girlfriend right. It's okay to say no. It's okay to do a lot of different things that entails being a good person. And that's the way I coach. I've tried to coach in a way that when kids got out of our program, they were a better man going through it. And uh, wins and losses are important, there's no doubt, but it's not the main reason we do that. And that title coach, I'm as passionate about it as anybody that ever carried that title. My grandkids call me coach. That's, that's, that's what they call me. And uh, uh, I, I strongly believe in, in it, and I think there's so many lessons that young coaches can learn in this book. I think there's lessons that, that families can learn. Uh, it gives you an idea of what... Uh, Fortitude, just being able to get up and, and you know, pick yourself up and move forward and and, uh, and do those things and uh, uh, can do for a person in life and what God can do for a person mm-hmm. in life. And, uh, there's no doubt His faith has guided me. My wife's got a chapter in the book about being a coach's wife, uh, uh, which I think is very important because it's a different lifestyle. She's tutored so many young coaches' wives and. Mm-hmm. Uh, She's been with me every step of the way, and, and she's the inspiration on this earth that, that's guided me through. She's my, I call her the head coach. But uh, <laughs> I got one of those, too. <laughs> we've, gone through a, we've gone through a lot of great memories together, uh, and uh, I wouldn't change any of it. So. That's beautiful. Dr. Tom, what's your hope that well, uh, people um, take away from this book? My role in the life book coach? was really uh, my... I guess emphasis is on leadership. So I would bring in leadership principles, et cetera, from each chapter and see and amplify that more to where this book, again, it's, it's not a football book. I mean, any business leader would appreciate the book, and um, anyone that uh, is looking to better their, their own lives, because uh, I'm a proponent of what's called self-leadership. In mm-hmm. words, how you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. Right. And you learn to lead yourself in, in the ways that that uh, is accomplished. And that's the things that I'm actually bringing. At the end of every chapter, we have what's called How to Love with Tom Thompson. And so that's when I bring that to the to the book. And, um, okay. you know, I'm just uh, excited to have another reason to be around this man 
<laughs> and I mean, he's he's real humble. Doesn't like any accolade or spotlight. And and here we are putting you on the radio yeah, for millions of people it, to hear. You know, <laughs> but but you know, he's beginning to I think to come to understand that this is as much of his purpose as it was to him for him to pick up a whistle. Awesome. Uh, Forty-two right. years ago, and that the rest of his life is going to be helping coach the people that he comes in contact with. Okay. And. Uh, Great. And I hope the book will propel into maybe doing some inspirational speaking or some motivational speaking somewhere along it. Because I think there's a good story to tell in there. And, uh, Absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, a young guy who went through a tough upbringing and married his high school sweetheart, sweetheart who's been married now for 42 years. Both of us chased our dream and, and had some success awesome. with it. And, and uh, you know, overcame a lot of obstacles along the way, and I just think there's a good story, story to tell, and a lot of gaugeisms I call them, and and that that's more to do with the coaching philosophy aspect of it. I think there's a lot in there that young coaches can pick up and learn from. I hope. Uh, so anyway, I'm real proud of the book, and and you know, really really happy to be sitting here. Awesome. Well, again, the book is called The Life Coach. Small Town Lessons on Faith, Family, and Football by Coach Ronnie Gage and Tom Thompson II. Um, guys, we got about a minute left, but uh, before we go, if there's anyone listening to this interview, maybe has, um, maybe they're into sports, maybe they have a dream, but they don't know who God is. Maybe they, they're not even sure if God is real. What would you want to say to them? He's absolutely real. And uh, uh, just make that walk and uh, make that acceptance, and, and you'll, you'll learn real quick there's a there's going to be a big difference in your life uh god's grace is what gets you through day in and day out and and uh until you've had a chance to live that you don't understand it but don't be afraid to try it just make that step and and, and, and accept christ and i think you'll be a better person for it wonderful Dr. Tom? i would say that um if someone's questioning god they're in a great place because that's what he wants. He wants you to question him. You know, where are his children? And if you've been around children and their parents, they're continually saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I mean, <laughs> all sorts of things like that. And people get the notion, I think, that by questioning God, you're doubting him. Well, I would say if you're questioning him, you're realizing there's a chance he's there. And keep questioning. And if God has put you on that journey, the question, he's going to give you the answer if you just if you just keep the faith that you need to keep asking the question. Awesome. Well, again, our special guests have been Coach Ronnie Gage and Tom Thompson. I want to thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your stories and really uh, hoping that uh, the life coach gets out there and gets into a lot of hands and inspires a lot of people. So thank you so thank much, you, guys. Daniel, thank Appreciate you so it. much for your time. God Appreciate bless you guys. God bless you. Too. You've been listening to Divine Intervention with your host, Daniel Fazina. You can email Daniel at divineintervention at mail.com. That's divineintervention at mail.com. All programs of Divine Intervention are available online at divineinterventionradio.com. That's divineinterventionradio.com. Join us next time here on Divine Intervention. Hey, this is Daniel Fazina of Divine Intervention Radio. Jesus calmed a raging storm, healed paralytics, and even raised the dead. But are these types of events still happening today? The answer to this question, as you will see from reading my book, Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today, is an emphatic yes. Contained within the book is a collection of amazing true stories that attest to this fact. More information about Divine Intervention, 50 True Stories of God's Miracles Today can be found at divineinterventionradio.com. Divine Intervention is supported by the other perspective media recording artist, Poet Billy Lamont. More information about Poet Billy Lamont's CDs, books, and other perspective media can be found at www.billylamont.com.